Good afternoon. I've just had lunch with Rosie. We had a snack. We had nice chicken san salad sandwich and crisps and just soft drinks. And then her daughter came, so I've uh, come back to record. And uh, the hairdresser's been and done her hair, and it looks beautiful. And she's feeling well. So I'm now going to share with you the mass readings for today, Friday the 19th of July 2024. It's a perfect time, 4 minutes past 3 p.m. So I'm going to begin with Psalm 51, Psalm 67. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 51. Create a clean heart in me, O God. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In the great tenderness of your love, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt, and from my sin cleanse me. Create a clean heart in me, O God. And renew within me an upright spirit. Do not cast me out from your presence. And do not withhold your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And let a spirit of willingness sustain me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. A reading from Psalm 67. May all peoples and nations praise you, O God. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he let his face shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations sing and shout with joy. For you judge the peoples with righteousness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its fruit. May God, our God, bless us. May God indeed bless us. And may all the ends of the earth revere him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. And we pray for our faithful departed and those who've died suddenly and not in a very nice way. Eternal rest grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. And before reading sacred scripture, open my heart, O Holy Spirit, to receive your inspired word. Grant me wisdom to understand what you want to teach me and strength of will to follow wherever you lead. Amen. And the prayer for peace. Put peace into each other's hands and like a treasure, hold it. Amen. And the prayer of the year. God of blessings, in this year, give us a spirit of listening, of openness to your word, and longing for your kingdom. As we journey towards the Jubilee, a time of new beginnings, we pray for help and strength to heal our relationships with each other and all creation. 
Sing your song of love over us, renewing our faith and courage, so we may join our voices together, discovering new harmonies of hope, new melodies of reconciliation, attentive to the spirit and awake to the needs of the world. May we seek your life-giving presence as we join as one global family in a great symphony of prayer and praise. Amen. So now I'm going to share with you the Mass readings for Friday, 19th of July, and the liturgical readings are for the 15th week in Ordinary Time, Year 2. And the first reading is a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 38, 1 to 6, 21, 22, 7 to 8. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. Hezekiah fell ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came and said to him, The Lord says this, Put your affairs in order, for you are going to die. You will not live. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and addressed this prayer to the Lord. Our Lord, remember, I beg you, how I have behaved faithfully and with sincerity of heart in your presence and done what is right in your eyes. And Hezekiah shed many tears. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and say to Hezekiah, The Lord, the God of David, your ancestor, says this, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will cure you. In three days' time, you shall go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. I will save you from the hands of the king of Assyria. I will protect this city. Bring a fig poultice, Isaiah said. Apply it to the ulcer and he will recover. Hezekiah said, what is the sign to tell me that I shall be going up to the temple of the Lord? Here, Isaiah replied, is the sign from the Lord that he will do what he has said. Look, I shall make the shadow cast by the declining sun go back ten steps on the steps of Ahaz, and the sun went back the ten steps by which it had declined. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 38 You have held back my life, O Lord, from the pit of doom. You have held back my life, O Lord, from the pit of of doom. I said, so I must go away my life half spent, a sign to the world below for the rest of my years. You have held back my life, O Lord, from the pit of doom. I said, no more shall I see the Lord in the land of the living. No more shall I look upon men within this world. You have held back my life, O Lord, from the pit of doom. My home is pulled up and removed like a shepherd's tent. 
Like a weaver you have rolled up my life. You cut it from the loom. You have held back my life, O Lord, from the pit of doom. For you, Lord, my heart will live. You gave me back my spirit. You cured me, kept me alive, changed my sickness into health. You have held back my life, O Lord, from the pit of doom. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Instruct me, instruct in your way on an even path, lead me. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. The sheep that belong to me, listen to my voice, says the Lord. I know them and they follow me. Alleluia. 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 Gospel of Matthew 12. A reading from the Holy Gospel. According to Matthew chapter 12, 1 to 8, the theme, the Son of Man is master of the Sabbath. Jesus took a walk one Sabbath, one Sabbath day, through the cornfields. His disciples were hungry and began to pick ears of corn and eat them. The Pharisees noticed it and said to him, Look, your disciples are doing something that's forbidden on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his followers were hungry? How he went into the house of God and how they ate the loaves of offering which neither he nor his followers were allowed to eat, but which were for the priests alone. Or again, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath day the temple priests break the Sabbath without being blamed for it? Now here, I tell you, is something greater than the temple. And if you had understood the meaning of the words, what I want is mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the blameless, for the Son of Man is master of the Sabbath. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So the reflection this Gospel Friday week 15, Ordinary Time, Year 2, Matthew 12. When Jesus quotes the Jewish scriptures, it's often because he finds there a message or a word that corresponds to his own message and vision. At the end of today's Gospel reading, he quotes from the prophet Hosea. What I want is mercy, not sacrifice. For Hosea and for Jesus, what matters more to God than all the sacrifices that were offered in the temple in Jerusalem was this attitude of mercy. How was mercy understood? In the parable of the Good Samaritan, it was mercy that the Samaritan showed to the broken traveller on the roadside. Those who were broken in body and spirit often came up to Jesus with the prayer, have mercy on me. When Jesus brought life to the dying, healing to the sick, forgiveness to sinners, loving acceptance to the excluded, he was showing mercy 
To show mercy is to recognize the need of others and to respond to it with a generous spirit. In the beginning of today's Gospel reading, Jesus' disciples were in need of food. They were hungry. They picked ears of grain from a grain field to satisfy their hunger, which was perfectly legitimate at the time. When the Pharisees noticed this, they judged the disciples, saying what that what they were doing work on the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath law of rest. The Pharisees lacked mercy, failing to understand the need of the disciples for food. They were judgmental rather than merciful. Jesus revealed the merciful love of God for all and he called on us to show something of God's merciful love to others. As he says, quoting Hosea, this is what God wants. Jesus was closer to God than any human being. He was the Son of God. As a result, he knew better than anyone else what God wants. God wants to find among his people, among us all, a compassionate understanding and merciful heart. I sincerely wish that people would be like that within their families. You hear stories of children wanting to put their parents in care homes or control their money, want power of attorney when they've got all their faculties. I think, because I'm old, if I had money, I would want control of it until I die, unless I have been afflicted with Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. No matter how physically unfit I am or would be, I would not want anyone controlling any of my affairs except myself. And I get very upset and distressed when I'm asked for my opinion, I give it, and then the children of that family complain to me and another person that's also um, a friend of or someone very close to their loved one it's because it's inconvenient for them not having total control of their adult parent. But their adult parent doesn't have dementia or anything like that. They're just physically having issues. And you come under their aggression, is one way of saying it. They won't talk about it. They'll tell you it's none of your business. And um, once you've given that power of attorney away, that's it. You, they they can do anything with your life, change your life dramatically, and they're not actually in your life as much as the people who've been friends with them. You know, it's it's really the society we live in now is not like it was in Jesus's time. I think that old people were happier in those times because their children were around, they worked near home, granny was in their life and granny was with the grandchildren and life was much better for old people in those days. I think it's very, very bad for old people now and it's getting worse all the time. You're, 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 you know, you, you don't have the compassion and the mercy anymore on old people. I feel very, very sad for old people. And I've got a book here that I haven't read anything from, and it's called The Shattering of Loneliness. And I think that old people are very lonely these days. And I'm wondering what is in this book. And it's just 
Um, I'm just going to read from 66. I just opened it here. I didn't pick it. And the just man trailed God's shining agent over a black mountain in his giant truck while a restless voice kept harrying his woman. It's not too late. You can still look back at the red towers of your native Sodom, the square where once you sang, the spinning shed at the empty windows set in the tall house where sons and daughters blessed your marriage bed. A single glance, a sudden dart of pain stitching her eyes before she made a sound. Her body flaked into transparent salt and her swift legs rooted to the ground. Who will grieve for this woman? Does she not seem too insignificant for our concern? Yet in my heart, I will never deny her who suffered death because she chose to turn. Without venturing into the minefield of gender stereotypes, I think it's significant that these lines were written by a woman. Arkhamatova explores the symbolic potential of Lot's wife. Excuse me. From within, rescuing her from the status of a theological cartoon, conjuring up a lovable, pathetic presence. Arkhamatova had tasted the bitter fruits of ideological absolutism. She's so elegantly colourful in Modigliani's portraits would not countenance the sketching of a human complex destiny with nothing but charcoal, this artist. She redeems Lot's wife from two-dimensionality. Her poem enriches the story in ways that seem to me not only licit, but indispensable. Her compassionate insight spells a lesson for all time. What holds us back from unconditional self-giving is not just attachment to vice. Much that claims us is good and dear. To remember Lot's wife is to prepare for a severance that may may bring pain. And it's so painful. And here's a picture. <laughs> That's lovely. This is a picture of Anna Akamotova in the 1920s looking back. That's how they looked in those days. And in Luke's Gospel, Christ speaks of those who have left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, 1829. To perform such a departure causes suffering not only to oneself but to others whom one would hate to hurt. Many, excuse me, sorry, who construct their lives in response to God's call can testify to what Lot's wife knew that to follow God's shining agent may come at a cost that seems unbearable. Her nostalgia should touch our heart. I have cited the poem in the fine rendering of Kunitz and Haywood but wish to bring out further nuance in the last two lines. Their literal meaning is, Only my heart will never forget her who gave life away for the sake of a single glance. Arkhamatova sees Lot's wife's future offered up to her past. This bestows on the turning round a conscious sacrificial dimension having lost a world she loved the poet knew what that meant to acknowledge the nobility of lot's wife's final gesture 
To honour the oblation it spells is not to condone her incomplete conversion, but it is perhaps to begin to understand it. Lot's wife turns out to be a more ambiguous, more interesting figure than we may have expected. Whether we regard her final glance as a failure to understand, as a function of sinful inertia, or as a state of being pierced by homesickness, she stands before us, approachable and close. Christ's warning, remember Lot's wife's, touches us at many levels. For surely we have known, if not all, at least some of the dynamics she instantiates. From experience, we know the truth of St. Bernard's claim. In via vitae non proged regedi est, not to move forwards on the path of life is to slide back. Standing still is not an option. We need to stay fixed on the goal we would reach to mobilise our will, orient our desire. To cite Bernard again, Curemus desiderius er et profundcu virtutum. Let us run ahead by our desires and by progress in virtue. It is no coincidence, excuse me, I have a tickle of my nose, it's not so annoying, sorry. It is no coincidence that the Christian life is likened to a marathon, both in the Pauline letters and in St. Benedict's rule. To keep running is what matters and that right to the end. The fearful possibility of stalling should motivate us until our last breath. It may be helpful to dissect this risk by studying a character more fully drawn than that of Lot's wife. One is at hand in another classic work of Russian literature. When Anna Akhmatova was one year old, Lev Tolstoy, 1828 to 1910, at the height of his fame, began writing a story. He would keep revising for a decade. It was published posthumously. Father Sergius, a work of introspection, combines many themes that preoccupied Tolstoy. Critics have remarked that the protagonist resembles the writer A. N. Wilson, fascinated by Tolstoy's voluptuous life, and Sergius' battles against lust affirms not perhaps without revealing something of himself that Father Sergius is one of Tolstoy's more brilliantly lurid self-projections. Henri Troyat observes more specifically that Father Sergius, like the novel Resurrection of the same period with thematic similarities, displays Tolstoy's aspirations to abandon claims to distinction and join the pilgrim throng of the poor, to lose himself in it. Lena Steiner reads the story philosophically. She sees it exemplifying Tolstoy's Chopin-Hurrarian concern with truth revealed through action. The tendency to approach Father Sergius on the basis of meta-narratives bound to the author's life can blind us to the book's value as a study of religious motivation and a parable of wide application. 
read with a minimum of preconditioning. It offers, among other things, an enlightening perspective on Lot's wife, on what she helps us not to forget. Father Sergius began life as Prince Stefan Kasatsky, orphaned of his father at 12, with a doting mother. An officer of the Imperial Guard, he was distinguished both by his brilliant ability and by his immense self-esteem. He was ambitious, but at the same time remarkably truthful. He kept himself from dissipation. His chief fault was susceptibility to fits of fury during which he lost control of himself and became like a wild animal. He worshipped the Tsar Nicholas I. When Karsatsky set eyes on him, he was seized by the same rapture he experienced later on when he met the woman he loved. He yearned to sacrifice something, everything, even himself, to prove his complete devotion. Subliminally, intense and complex strivings went on within him. They expressed themselves outwardly in consuming perfectionism. Karsatsky's passion for distinguishing himself or for accomplishing something in order to distinguish himself filled his life. With these brushstrokes, Tolstoy sketches a man who defies easy categorization, at once feral and capable of selfless loyalty, driven by ambition, yet utterly truthful, possessed of a sensitive heart and a will of steel and driven by an unspecified urge that compels him in all domains of life to seek a neck plus ultra. The interplay of these factors is brought out when Karsatsky falls in love. His courtship of the beautiful Mary was pragmatic at first. She moved in circles more elevated than his. She was to be his portal. Soon, though, he was stricken. Naturally, he idolised her, regarding her with tender adoration as something unattainable. So yearning all the more to call her his thank, thanks to you, he told her, I have learnt that I'm better than I thought. In a conversation set by Tolstoy to trills of nightingales, Kasatsky professed his love to her, admitting at the same time the impure motives from which he had grown forth, begging Mary's pardon. His frankness emboldened her too, to speak a secret. Sure of his pardon, she confessed that she had been the Tsar's mistress. She did not find the indulgence she had hoped for. Kasatsky, appalled, recalled how affably the emperor had wished him well on his engagement. Feeling betrayed by the two beings he had set above all others, he left the town and regiment, arranged his affairs and entered a monastery. His mother wrote to try to dissuade him from the decisive step, but he replied that he felt God's call, which transcended all other considerations. Only his sister, who was as proud and ambitious as he, understood him. She understood that he had become a monk in order to be above those who considered themselves his superiors. And she understood him correctly. By becoming a monk, he showed contempt for all that seemed most important to others and had seemed so to himself. While he was in the service, 
and he now ascended a height from which he could look down on those he had formerly envied. Relying on the flair of Princess Kasatskia and their own inferences, those who discourse on Father Sergius tend at this point to pronounce their condemnation of Karsatsky's pride and to declare his monastic purpose a mockery. They overlook the comment that follows, which adjusts the picture Tolstoy would have us know that it was not this alone, as his sister Varvara supposed that influenced him. There was also in him something else, a sincere religious feeling, which Varvara did not know, which intertwined itself with the feeling of pride and the desire for preeminence and guided him. His disillusionment, I, I, and his sense of injury were so strong that they brought him to despair and the despair had led him to what? To God, to his childhood's faith which had never been destroyed in him. Karsatsky left the world in defiance, yes, but his defiance stirred up something sincere. He was, after all, remarkably truthful. To fail to take this intermingling of incentives into account is to be sure to be misunderstood and misunderstand the story it's also to miss the first challenge posed by Karsatsky to those who would remember Lot's wife to maintain a forward momentum. We need to be honest enough to discern and unpick our complete motivations, to enquire what arises from our passions what may stand a chance of being from God, then to enact a prudent, generous response. Karsatsky embraced monastic life with the zeal one would expect. His determination paid dividends. Humility towards his inferiors was not merely easy for him, but afforded him pleasure. Even victory over the sins of the flesh, greed and lust, was easily attained. Tolstoy does not, though, let us dismiss Kasatsky's faith as merely delusional. Aspects of monastic life brought him joy and let him taste self-transcendence. What haunted him was his unfulfilled past. There were moments when all that made up his present life suddenly grew dim before him, moments when if he did not cease to believe in the aims he had set himself, he ceased to see them and could evoke no confidence in them, but was seized by a remembrance of, and terrible to say, a regret for the change of life. He had made. In his seventh year in the monastery, his inner life dried up, his spirit was drowsy, his vanity burgeoned, monastic ambition, the very thing he had found so repulsive in other monks, rose within him. This state of weary boredom is not unique to Father Sergius. The name that Kasatsky was given at profession. Tradition calls it acidic, a state of latent depression that can assail the most fervent monk, sometimes as a trial lasting several years. A brutal purification during which spiritual life seems to be eclipsed by the demands and sheer resistance of the flesh. It is the tendency Origen diagnosed in Lot's wife. 
Sergius' example helps us mobilize a counterattack. It shows that conversion must be constructed in aspirational, not reactive terms, as an option for what is good, not against what is thought bad or dangerous. It is an ongoing task. The soul's compass needle must never be realigned to true north. If not, we shall find ourselves like Sergius, at the mercy of trivial temptations, apparently drawn back into a morass of attractions and deceits we thought we had left behind for good. Assignation to a monastery near the capital made Sergius's predicament worse. Gorpus distracted and repelled him. For help, he turned to his Darets, who told him that pride was the cause of his malaise. Solitude seemed the appropriate remedy, so Sergius was sent to a hermitage. Here his interior combat began in earnest. The man who at first had thought monastic life easy found reclusion hard. Not on account of the fasts and the prayers, they were no hardship to him, but on account of an inner conflict he had not at all anticipated. The sources of that conflict were two doubts and the lust of the flesh, and these two enemies always appeared together. It seemed to him that they were two foes, but in reality they were one and the same. As soon as doubt was gone, so was the lustful desire. But thinking them to be two different fiends, he fought them separately. The desert fathers, though innocent of Freud, insisted on the interconnectedness of the passions the most libidinal may voice what is really a spiritual malady, which is why it is futile to combat them in isolation. Sergius still had to learn this, but he was fighting and thereby growing in awareness. I may deceive others, but not myself or God. I am not a majestic man but a pitiable and ridiculous one. With a gospel phrase he prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Nothing suggests he was insincere. Without knowing it, Sergius approached his life's supreme trial. It arose from within a merry company of rich people on a troika ride in the country. Among them was a divorcee who amazed and shocked the town by her escapades. Hearing they were close to Kasatsky's retreat, she bet her friends she could seduce him. The initiative was not just wanton. Setting out for her conquest, the woman, Makavonikina, looked around her and mused, with Shakespearean pathos. Always the same and always nasty. The same red shiny faces smelling of wine and cigars, the same talk, the same thoughts, and always about the same things. And they're all satisfied and confident it should be so, and will go on living like that till they die. But I can't. It bores me. I want something that would upset it all and turn it upside down. Suppose it happened to us as to those people at Saritavos, was it, who kept on driving and froze to death. What would our people do? How would they behave? Basely, for certain, each for himself, and I too should act badly, but I, at any rate, have beauty. They all know it. And how about that monk? Is it possible that he has become indifferent to it, 
No, that's the one thing they all care for. Like that cadet last autumn. <laughs> what a fool he was. Mikov, Mikovkina, Mikovkina turns out to be an outsider in the company that looks to her as its centre. She knows an acidic of her own, a dissatisfaction redeemed only by the certainty of her own irresistible attraction. The thought of Kasatsky provokes her. On the one hand, she hopes he might be different, fit to offer relief. On the other, she relies on his being like everybody else to affirm the identity she had constructed for herself. When she knocked on his door, Sergius knew at once he was faced with an opponent more terrible than any he had known, one who engaged his weakness at every level. Makovkina knew that he knew and enjoyed the knowledge of it when they looked at each other through the hermitage window their eyes met with instant recognition not that they had ever known one another they had never met before but by the look they exchanged they and he particularly felt that they knew and understood one another. They were kindred souls, set on opposite courses. She the image of all in him that was unsurrendered. She enticed the old self he had battled to put off by a mixture of ruses and genuine calls for help. The night was dark, the place remote, Makovikina gained access, while Sergius withdrew to an inner room and locked the door. Try as he might to ignore her, her nearness spellbound him. He felt his own weakness and that he might be lost at any moment. That was why he prayed unceasingly. He felt rather as the hero in the fairy tale must have felt when he had to go on and on without looking round. A single look would be fatal. He knew it. At the same time, he wanted nothing more than to look. When Makov Kina, thinking she was ill, began to cry in distress. For God's sake, come to me, I'm dying. He could not as a Christian, refuse. But as a man, he could not take the risk. He recalled the saint who laid one hand on the adulteress and thrust his other into the brazier. But putting his fingers over his paraffin lamp, he could not stand the pain. Well, he asked, shall I perish? He cried out, no, not so opening the door. He went without looking at her through the cell into the porch where he used to chop wood. There he felt for the block and for an axe which leant against the wall. Immediately he said and taking up the axe with his right hand he laid the forefinger of his left hand on the block swung the axe and struck with it below the second joint. He hastily wrapped the stump in the skirt of his cassock and pressing it to his hip, went back into the room and standing in front of the woman, lowered his eyes, asked in a low voice, What do you want? Makoff Kina, perceiving what had happened, was cut to the quick. She left, imploring Sergius's forgiveness. A year later, she entered 
a convent as a novice and lived a strict life. He had managed to go on and without looking round, she had turned his extreme action not to be hastily emulated illumines our remembrance of Lot's wife. When siren songs call us back to life, our best self had decided to leave. We must stop our ears and cut ourselves off from the source of temptation, however sweetly it may beckon. For Sergius, a new life began he redoubled his mortification, became fervent in prayer. His spirit came alive. His first cure occurred in the eighth year of his life as a hermit. He had not intended it. It unnerved him. He had only heeded a distraught mother's plea to pray over her child. The news spread. People took to calling him Starrets. Flocks of pilgrims arrived. Sergius was spun into a new web of temptations. Increasingly, he felt that what was internal became external and that the fount of living water within him dried up. And that what he did now was done more and more for men and less and less for God. He could not see, he could see the good he was doing, but self-consciousness poisoned virtue. He thought himself a shining light, and the more he felt this, the more he was conscious of a weakening, a dying down of the divine light of truth that shone within him. When his mind was clear, he would weep for the grace he had known and lost. Raising the shriveled stump of his finger to his lips, but his usual state of mind was one of weariness and tender pity for himself because of that weariness. He was nauseated by the wonder seeking crowds. At the same time, he needed the distraction and praise they provided. Solitude had started to burden him. He knew that his compassion had dried up, that he had become vain, yet he must rise to the part of saint in which he was cast. He could not fail to believe in the miracles he himself witnessed. He prayed to be cleansed of pride, but resigned himself to not being heard. When one day a sensual and feeble-minded woman brought to him for healing, embraced him lasciviously. Sergius was vanquished without even putting up a fight. He had no resistance left. Having fought like a hero in the fullness of his manhood, he fell in old age with frightening ease in a setting of pathetic squalor. His fall is like a warning sign. Forward progress is never assured. The urge to turn back persists deep within. Apparent success must never seduce us into thinking we are beyond temptation's reach. As Newman, who knew a thing or two about it, once remarked in a rousing, unsettling sermon, to be at ease is to be unsafe. It is never too late to turn into a pillar of salt. Getting back to Lot's wife. Running away from his hermitage by stealth, the woman still asleep in his cell, Sergius despaired. He was tempted to hang himself when from nowhere he saw behind his mind's eye a face from a distant past. It was the face of Pashenka, his cousin, a thin little girl with large, mild eyes and a timid, pathetic face. As in a dream, he remembered a scene from childhood. He is playing with some boys 
when Pashenka is brought and they have to play with her, but it's dull. She's silly and it ends by their making fun of her and forcing her to show how she can swim. She lies down on the floor and shows them and they all laugh and make a fool of her. She sees this and blushes in patches and becomes more pitiable than before, so pitiable that he feels ashamed and can never forget that crooked, kindly, submissive smile. She had married a man who beat her, squandered her inheritance and died. Sergius had seen her as a widow, penurious. She had been still the same, not exactly stupid, but insipid, insignificant and pitiable. Without knowing why, the thought of her life recurred to him each time he thought of ending his. At last he fell asleep, and in his sleep he saw an angel who came to him and said, Go to Pashenka and learn from her what you have to do, what your sin is and wherein lies your salvation. When he awoke, he set out. Having found Pashenka, he quickly learned his lesson. Though her life was hard, she did not complain. To be at the service of all was second nature to her. She thought herself a poor wife, mother and Christian, but had charitable excuses for the shortcomings of everyone else. Pashenka, said Sergius to himself, is what I ought to have been, but failed to be. I lived for men on the pretext of living for God, while she lives for God, imagining she lives for men. Selflessness was what he had to learn. There is no God for the man who lives as I did, for human praise. I will now seek him. Thus Sergius set out again, starting afresh, walking, begging, reading the Gospels, settling quarrels, helping people however he could. And little by little, God began to reveal himself within him. In the ninth month of his itinerant existence, as if reborn to new life, Sergius was arrested as a tramp and sent to Siberia. The story's last sentence, switching from the past tense to the present, shows the ultimate simplification wrought in this paradoxically constituted man. In Siberia, he has settled down as a hired man of a well-to-do peasant, in which capacity he works in the kitchen garden, teaches children and attends to the sick, fully delivered to the open horizon. His end sheds a little further ray of light on the image of Lot's wife. It may not be sufficient to depart only once. We must be ready to break up again and again, to leave even what we thought would be our final destination to let love be purified. Far from er erupting fever fantasies of a frustrated mind, Father Sergius is solidly rooted in Christian experience and consciousness. It is based on a story from Russia's butler, Dmitri of Rostov's Lives of the Saints, who I read regularly. I'm going to do some more soon. Anyone can look up St. James the Faster under the 4th of March and recognise explicit references in Tolstoy, who was honest enough to acknowledge his source. It was he who endowed Sergius with character. But outline of the story is traditional. Perhaps tradition is best placed to interpret it. A hymn for the Feast of St. James proclaims a little use.
are a hundred victories. If in the final battle you lose your head, several battles could have been Sergius's last, but had he not been stubborn enough to keep fighting? Even his pride was made to serve a slow growth in humility, drawing him out of the spiritual death into veritable resurrection. He eventually realised the gift of self to a greater cause he had yearned for as a young man. Even when our feet are already starting to be rooted to the ground, we have it in our power, Sergius shows us, to resist salvation. If our no to perdition is loud enough, an angel will extend his hand and pull us forwards. He will let us regain the agility we require to resume movement towards the rising dawn. I'm going to stop there. That's the end of chapter three. I didn't read the rest yet. <laughs> so that was quite funny. I didn't know it was going to be like that. I thought it was going to be different. So if you, I might read the rest. And chapter four is Do This in Memory of Me. This is quite an interesting book. Um, it's And there's chapter five. The counselling will call everything to mind. I'm not quite sure. Afterward, in memoriam, I'll read that little bit. I have dedicated this book to the memory of Father Michael Kayal, an Armenian Catholic priest from Aleppo, in early 2012. 26 years old, he returned to Syria, newly ordained after completing studies at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome. I would encounter him there most days. We did not know each other. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I have a tickle in my throat. I'll just finish this memorial bit. Um, we did not know each other, but exchanged greetings when we met. He struck me as a kindly gentleman when I saw him in the hall or library. He behind his little mountain of books, I behind mine. The Syria to which Michael returned was in a state of turmoil. With the oil of priestly anointing still moist in the palms of his hands, he set out to help the poorest of the poor. He went daily to shelters for the homeless, or whatever faith, driven from home by ravages of war. He brought them food, medicines, spiritual aid and the gift of himself. Like so many of his compatriots, he felt the weight of a senseless destructive war, yet did not yield to resignation. One of his friends remembers him saying, What I can do is serve. Nothing is greater than that. On 9th of February 2013, he caught a bus out of Aleppo. It was seized by rebels. Michael was abducted by armed men who called his family to demand an astronomical sum for his re release. To prove his identity, he was given a moment to speak with his mother, time enough to say, Mother, pray for me. No one has heard from him since. We do not know whether he's still of this world, whether his name belongs to the memento for the living or to the memento for the dead, whether his life's rose grows still in solid soil or has been gathered, he will not be forgotten. When I think of Michael, and I do each day, I sometimes sense a revulsion like the one I knew as a child on realising what scars the scourge of malice can inflict. Faced with the Mysterium Iniquitatis, we feel we need to make some kind of response. But what can we say? Evil is illogical. I feel at such times like the wanderers to Emmaus, 
who succumbed to momentary, momentary paralysis. They stood still looking sad. Luke twenty four seventeen. Their story, though, goes on. The stranger in their midst pulls them along, draws them out. He listens, challenges, explains. Without the wanderer's conscious knowledge, he subverts their grief. He invests it with a sense at table. He transubstantiates it. What seemed like loss turns out to be gain. Apparent defeat reveals its face as victory. Loneliness thaws before a presence that sets fire hearts on fire. The two who earlier stood listless, leaden on the road, unable to go further, run to Jerusalem, bursting with new understanding, impatient to share it. The moment of insight at Emmaus has always been attractive to contemplatives. Some such have painted it marvellously. I love Rembrandt's supper at Emmaus. In the Musée Jacquemart, André, it lets a sheen of brightness issue from Christ. Cleophas, or is it his companion, has knocked over his chair, sprung up over to fall to his knees, while in the next room the innkeeper's wife goes about her business undisturbed. She lets us see that the scene for being sensation is intensely private. I love Caravaggio's rendering of the support in the National Gallery. Here the pilgrims are men of certain age, dishevelled and fragile looking, hardly daring to believe the vindication contained in Christ's assertive blessing. A view that touches me especially is a fresco from St. Huguet's de Chartreuse by Arcabas, printed on the cover of his book. Arcabas exegetes the supper at Emmaus with the naturalness of one who has lived with the scene for a lifetime. The mood is of friendship. It draws the spectator in. Hospitably, the pilgrims talk among themselves. Christ is pensively silent, unimposing, but it is he who lends the picture warmth. He knows that his companions need to talk before they can listen. They're caught up in what they have lived through. Archibas calls something essential to our attention. God remembers us before we remember God. Christ seeks the wanderers out when they, for their part, have despaired of finding him. He hears their anguish as a silent call. In a moment, he will hold the bread of mourning up as a Eucharistic host. Behind the pilgrim on the right sits a fourth person whose profile is concealed. I take that to be me. Or you. We are invited to sit down and share our story, assured that we've never been out of God's mind. The old has passed, the new has come, there is a shimmer of glory to things. The Norwegian poet Olaf Bull, 1883 to 1933, sixfold nominee for the Nobel Prize, devoted an important part of his production to elegiac reflection on the premature death of the woman he loved. There is a piercing sorrow to these poems, yet they pulsate with a conquered certainty of purposefulness. It invests them with a kind of exultation, joy in the most purified form. One such text, at the monastery, describes the poet sitting in the park at Trefontaine, the venerable abbey in the suburbs of Rome, refounded as Cistercian by St Bernard, he slumped in the mournful reverie, numbed by self-pity. The sinking sun on the horizon seems to symbolise his soul's dying ember. Sadness prevails. But then the monk, who has sat listening and wordless at his table, 
stands up, holding on to a glass of pure Falerno. The man of silence speaks glowing words into the descent of night. He exhorts the poet to remember his love, which no appearance of death can efface. Such remembrance remains, will always remain, charged with eternity. And I can't read the rest on page 163 because it's, it's in a foreign language, but turning the page 164, it is in English, and I will read it. It will be the last in this video. Sorry, but I didn't start at the right place. But who knows, might, might be able to do some of it. It's called The Shattering of Loneliness on Christian Remembrance by Eric Varden, Bloomsbury. It's quite interesting. He's a very good writer, isn't he? Um, I hadn't planned to do it, but it's it's just I picked it up and I thought this will look and sound. It is interesting, so I will do some more of it. But we've done started it in the middle rather than the beginning, and this is the ending. Apart from the author's notes, which I won't look at. Yes, this is the end of it. Yes, memory beats in the heart of our race. Each ray of it, life upon death's abyss, till man, through great hardship, is himself reduced to remembrance. That is when the unheard of happens. We the less, who dreamt a bridge between then and now, shall be remembered by one greater, who keeps us securely in mind. This I believe, that all remembrance in this homeland of our pain is life-filled seed, a spark from the great sun of truth about what has been alive cannot die. The word warm, silent, immense, fell thus. The two of us listened intently together. From the depth of the monastery garden arose a chorus of singing children's voices. So I went home across the meadow's solitude while the monk pursued his evening stroll among the amiable dead at rest behind the cemetery wall. So what I'll do when I upload the video I will give you the name of the book The Shattering of Loneliness on Christian Remembrance so it's got an angle on it and then I'll give you the name of the author it's it's he's a monk he's Don Eric Varden OCSO Abbot of Mount St Bernard Abbey in Leicestershire Norwegian by birth he was, before entering religious life, a fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. Actually, his, his writing is very readable, very readable, and it's very, very interesting. So I'll put his details under, who knows, I m might uh, actually, maybe that's writings in, it looks like Russian to me, in an earlier page. Um might read what I didn't read, which is the beginning. <laughs> I just started from the middle. <laughs> Where I opened it, I thought, oh yeah, this looks interesting. I had no idea what I'd be reading. Um, it's, a, it's very, it's different, isn't it? It's very different. It's very real though. Yeah, so I might do some more of that at some point. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. I'm sending you his peace in abundance and may you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. And just this last couple of words after reading sacred scripture, which a lot of it was, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the word you have spoken to me through the treasure of the scripture. Make these words a living reality in my life 
a constant guide, a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. Amen. I'm hoping when I'm uploaded this to do the Bible in one year. Day 362, I believe, is the next one. I haven't typed any more up. I will, as soon as this is recorded, that one, I will start again. So we haven't got many days. Have we? We've got three more days to type and, and record. So, And then I can get back on with the butlers, Lives of the Saints, because I do love them. I, I, I just like, they're so fascinating, the saints, aren't they? <laughs> okay, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.